In this video, I wanted to continue discussing the assumptions of the linear model, and particularly want to focus on this second bullet point, uh, that the classic linear model assumes that there is no error in the x variables. So as this figure shows, um, traditional regression models assume that all of the error is in the y direction. We calculate the difference between the expected value of y that comes from our model and our observed y just as the difference in that y direction. Uh, that said, we also often know that there can be non-negligible error in our measurements of x's. So if the x's are not precise, they have some uncertainty associated with them. In a Bayesian framework, we uh, have the capacity to include this error in x using what's called the errors and variables framework. And so to start off, let's uh, think about our classic regression model. Our expected value involves some intercept plus some slope times x. They'll note that the errors and variables uh, framework can be applied to, to any model, not just linear models. Um, on top of uh, this process model, we would have a data model. We'll start with our traditional assumption that y is going to be normally around uh, the expected value coming from mu, and the, uh, in this case, we're returning to our assumption of constant variance sigma squared. Uh, but now we're adding, in addition to a data model for the y, we're adding a data model for the x. So we have some set of observed x's, this x superscript o, that are normally distributed around the true value of x, uh, given some observation error tau. So here, sigma is the error in the y direction, and tau is the error in the x direction, is, and it's specifically the observation error in tau. So you, you may now asking, you know, if this is a observed x here, then where is, what is this actual x that's going into the regression model? Uh, this, what I'm calling the true value of x, uh, which we never actually observe directly, we, in, we can't observe it directly, but we can in, estimate it indirectly. Uh, and statistically, this is often referred to as a latent variable something that is latent if we do not observe it uh, directly. So we have this indirectly inferred x that's actually informing the relationship between x and y. So there's some true relationship between x and y that we're not seeing directly because we only see the observed x's with some observation error. Um, on top of this, we're going to need to add our, our standard set of priors. So there's going to be a prior on the betas, which we always had before, prior in the sigma, like we had before, um, there's going to be a prior on tau, uh, which is new, but that makes sense because we have this observation uh, model on tau. Uh, it should be noted that the errors and variables models tend to uh, converge and, and behave much better if you have an informative prior on this tau. So, you know, without that, it can often be uh, a little bit challenging statistically to distinguish errors and x's associated with tau from errors and y's associated with sigma. Uh, but uh, that said, you know, there are the situations where we have some independent estimate of the observation errors are, are actually, um, or, or some way of estimating it, is decently common. That's not an unreasonable expectation that we might have a prior on that. Uh, and then finally, what might not be obvious is that we also want to put a prior on the x's. Uh, because they are themselves estimated parameters, these latent state variables x, uh, that are, that, since they need to be estimated, they're unknowns, they, they also get a prior. Uh, this graphical model uh, depicts the model we just went through, um, and in purple I've highlighted the things that are different between this model and uh, the standard linear model. So one thing you'll notice is that uh, our x's are now part of the process model, and our latent x's are related to our y's. Again, with all of this was the same as before, with some betas, some sigmas, and priors on those. We then have the observation error model between the latent x's and the observed x's, and no direct relationship between our observed uh, x's and our observed y's. Uh, and then we have to have priors on our x's and priors on our tau's. We can get a better understanding of what's actually happening 
under the hood in this model, if we take a look at this full model and break it down into the conditionals that we need to estimate, for example, uh, if we were to do this uh, in MCMC using Gibbs sampling. And in fact, what we'll see if we break down into, instead of looking at the full posterior distribution uh, for the joint distribution of beta, uh, sigma, tau, and x, but look at the conditional distributions of each of those individually. So if we look at just the betas, we only need to collect terms from the joint model that involve the betas, which is going to be our uh, data model, you know, our likelihood here, uh, and then also the priors and the betas. And that's exactly the same as we had in the tra traditional regression model. Uh, and as in the traditional regression model, that is a conjugate distribution, so we can just sample the betas directly. Uh, similar with the sigma, we have our, our likelihood and our prior on sigma. So we can combine the, those conjugately and sample our sigmas di uh, directly conditional on the betas. Uh, tau involves uh, the, the data model connecting the observed x's and the latent x's and the prior on tau. So that is also conjugate and can be good sample directly. Uh, and then we also need to be able to estimate all the x's, which I'm just representing this as a, a you know, vector or matrix of x's. Um, and we can see that there's actually three terms in this likelihood because there's the data model on the observed x's, there's the prior on those x's, but there's also the, the likelihood on the relationship between x and y. So we actually learn about the latent state of x, both from the observed x's and from the observed y's. Um, and then we have the prior. So conceptually with the MCMC, you can imagine that it's going through this loop where it's going to update our regression model given the current values of x, update the observation errors uh, given the current values of x, the current latent values of x and observed x's, and then update those x's based on uh, the observed values of x and the regression model. Uh, and, and overall, um, we are integrating over the possible values that x can take on. So you can kind of imagine as we're running the MCMC, the actual values of x are bouncing around a bit because there's uncertainty in them. Uh, but we keep updating those x's and, and updating the re regression model. Uh, this slide shows how we might implement a model like this in JAGS. Uh, we can see that in black are the parts that are, are the same from our, our classic, um, or I guess are now commonly uh, discussed Bayesian regression model. Um, but now we've added uh, within this for loop, we've added the, the data model relating the observed x's and the latent x's. So the, what's in purple, the y and the xo, is what we'd have to pass in through our data object. Uh, and then we'd have these uh, the priors on x's up here. We'd loop over all of our x's and set up priors on all of those. Here I'm just putting a uniform distribution on those x's. Uh, and here, um, I'm putting a you know a conjugate gamma prior on those those tau's, and as our MCMC runs, we'll get posterior estimates of our different parameters. Here are the trace plots and densities of sigma and tau, showing that we actually uh, are able to identify each of them, um, and in this case, that our precision uh, on tau is much higher than our precision on sigma. So so we actually do have uh, fairly precise estimates on on the tau, at least relative to the, the residual error in the model. Uh, but we also end up with a posterior dis distribution for every single x. In practice, these are often kind of nuisance parameters. We, we aren't necessarily interested in what the latent value of x actually takes on, which is something we need to be able to integrate over those possible values of x in order to account for the uncertainties in x's formally. And then this plot shows. Um, the posterior distributions uh, for both the x's and y's at the same time. So uh, what I've plotted here, these horizontal green lines for each data point are the 95% the confidence intervals on uh, the posterior estimates of x. So this is giving us an estimate of how much uncertainty 
we have associated with the X. Um, and then the vertical green lines are our 95% um, confidence intervals, which are telling us about you know, our, our uncertainty in the Y direction. And then I've connected uh, the posterior mean of where those lines cross uh, to the actual observed value. And one of the things that you'll notice here is that the vast majority of those uh, posterior distributions uh, are, are actually centered over the current value, which actually kind of makes sense. You know, all else being equal, you know, are, are the most likely value uh, for uh, this latent estimate of X is actually the one that we observe. Um, but accounting for that there is, there's uncertainty in that. The, the exceptions that we see here are right on the edges um, where we can see that there's a bit of a, a, a diagonal on this left edge and a bit of diagonal on the right edge. And that's actually a result of the fact that in this particular case, we assumed that, uh, that X had a uniform distribution between uh, zero and 10, which gives us uh, a posteriors for those parameters that are near the edge uh, that become uh, you know, truncated and thus you know, a bit skewed. And so we're seeing that. Uh, this vision of accounting for uncertainty in X as actually still being centered around the current value of X is, is in quite a bit of contrast with things like reduced major axis regression which try to minimize the orthogonal distance between any particular x and a y. So you can imagine a perpendicular line coming from the regression slope to a point. Um, and traditionally, uh, the idea of things like reduced major axis re uh, regression um, has been argued uh, as a way of accounting for the observation errors in x's. Uh, but we can actually see that it, it does something very different than that. You know, it instead is minimizing the th orthogonal distance. Um, and we'll, we'll find that when you do that, you end up with the assumption that, you know, for any data point that's above the regression line, we're assuming that all the residual errors are in one direction, you know, skewed to the um, left, and all the residual errors in the, on the uh, negative residual errors assume, are assumed to be skewed. <clears throat> to the right, which isn't really a, real, a realistic assumption. Um, <clears throat> it actually is quite different from what we get when we observe, observe that. So just making the point that, that uh, um, RMA regression is not actually uh, accounting for the observation errors and X's, uh, because it also creates the impression that um, your observation errors and X are uh, going to be highly sensitive to your estimate of your slope. You know, that the steeper that slope, um, you know, the greater the errors in your X's, which doesn't make sense. Why, you know, there's no reason that our, that the slope of the line and the uncertainties in X's uh, should actually be related to each other. Uh, so a few additional thoughts on errors and variables. Um, first noting out that we can write that down in a more general form where there, you know, are observed X's or, or follow any distribution G uh, given our latent state X and some set of parameters, uh, that these distributions do not need to be normal. Uh, these errors do not need to be additive. Uh, and they can account for known biases. So imagine that you know, uh, instead of just having um, the observed X's being you know, centered around the current X's, here I've written down a, a model that implies that there's you know, potentially both a mul multiplicative and an additive, additive bias uh, between the observed X's and their latent state. Um, and that these observation error models uh, could be um, you know, uh, very, very complex. You, know, you could think about things like in remote sensing where you know, the, the observation error models, uh, the things that link you know, you know, what we actually observe, which are things like reflectance to the actual states of the systems, you know, could be represented by complex mechanistic radiative transfer models as an example of a place where G might actually be quite complicated. Um, I'll also note that we can use these uh, sorts of errors and variables models uh, when the thing we observe may be a different type 
in the, the latent state, you know, for example, where you have a proxy or we have some sort of calibration curve between what's actually observed and, and what we represent. And as noted before, it can be very useful to have informative priors, uh, especially on the uncertainties and, and again on the, you know, on any sort of uh, calibration relationships. Uh, you know, it's very useful to have those informative priors. <clears throat> An example of, of a, you know, not complicated, but, you know, a non-trivial uh, errors and variables model would be the case where we have some sort of calibration. Uh, so imagine in the bottom panel here, I'm interested in the relationship between growth and moisture status, in this case, soil moisture. And this could be growth of, say, a plant. Um, now, in many cases, we don't observe soil moisture directly because doing so would be destructive. We'd have to take a soil core and, and weigh it and oven dry and weigh it again. And to measure soil moisture repeatedly, we'd turn uh, the soil to Swiss cheese. Um, so instead, we often rely on instruments such as TDR, in this case, time domain reflectometry, which is a, a measure of the electrical impedance of the soil. Um, and so we can develop an empirical calibration curve between the soil moisture and the TDR. And so what we actually observe is the TDR, we convert that TDR to soil moisture, and that soil moisture uh, is the X in this relationship. But we can see that there is uncertainty in that X. Now I'll note that this calibration curve you know, has an R squared in, in excess of 95%, you know, the sort of thing that's frequently used to argue that you know, the uncertainties in the calibration are, are negligible and we're just going to treat uh, soil moisture as if it was observed directly. Um, well, what happens if we do that? So let, if we zoom in a little bit to this uh, response curve, in, in this case, I generated this uh, with simulated data. So I actually have a known true relationship uh, that I was simulating data from. So I generated observations from that true relationship. Uh, and then I was able to fit this model, you know, uh, which is kind of a uh, curvilinear model, like, such as the michaelis menten relationship, um, either uh, accounting for the errors and variables in red or not accounting for the variables in blue. So in blue, I just treat uh, the X's as if they were observations of soil moisture. And in the red, I account for the fact that what I actually observed was this proxy TDR, and I relate that uh, to latent variable. Now, a couple of things you'll notice here. Um, first of all, the, when I account for the errors and variables, I do end up with a wider constant interval. So I'm adding an additional source of uncertainty. Um, and that source of uncertainty means that, that I have less confidence about the overall relationship. Uh, I would argue that that's actually a good thing in this case, because that represents a, a genuine uh, source of uncertainty that minimizing your interval estimates isn't necessarily the right thing to do if it represents overconfidence. And so that's the second thing I wanted to point out here. So the green, the blue line that ignores the error and variables, not only is the uh, confidence interval narrower, uh, but that interval estimate does not actually include the true model most of the time. You know, it crosses it at two points just because, you know, two curves are going to cross at some point. Um, because they're not parallel lines. Uh, but we can see that, you know, in this key middle area uh, where we're applying this model, that, you know, the, the estimate here excludes the true model uh, by a good bit, and, and that we don't know that. We're, we're overconfident in an incorrect model by ignoring that errors and variables. Uh, by contrast, the wider estimate uh, in the red model, not only is, is does it it include the true model, but the actual uh, parameter estimates for that relationship are actually much closer to the correct ones. So accounting for the errors and variables brings, brought the model closer and brought it within an overlapping interval with the, the true model. Uh, so more broadly, <clears throat> um, this idea of errors and variables introduces a really important statistical concept that we're going to leverage uh, in another number of other models throughout this semester, and that's this idea of latent variables. With latent variables being any variable where we're not observing the state of the system directly. And so in that case, our values have to be inferred from the model. Um, and so 
that requires us to have a, a prior on their values uh, and that both the data and the process models provide constraint on those estimates of the latent variable. So here we had, again, you know, data model from the Y, a data model from the observed X, and a prior. Um, the MCMC will integrate over this uncertainty in the Xs by numerically sampling the values of the, that the unobserved variable could take on. Um, it does contribute uncertainty to our estimates of parameters and to the model, uh, but this is often a case where ignoring that variability would lead to falsely overconfident conclusions. Uh, so to wrap up, uh, we've thus co far covered two different assumptions of the linear model, homoscedasticity, and that there's no errors in Xs, and prevent presented uh, alternative ways to address those uh, uncertainties, such as modeling the variance explicitly or accounting, using an error in variables model to account for the uncertainty in X. Uh, as we dive into these additional assumptions, we'll see that we'll eventually be building up a toolkit of possible solutions for how to relax the assumptions of the linear model. And in practice, you wouldn't necessarily throw all of these uh, approaches at any particular problem, but you would uh, diagnose a particular problem you're working on to figure out which of these assumptions that are being violated uh, are, are the most important and are you know, the largest uh, violations of these assumptions and start by tackling some of those violations you know, one at a time. You know, say, you know, for example, if you uh, saw that the amount of heteroscedasticity we thought, saw in that model, you might start with there, that, and then maybe go on to ask the question of whether there's uncertainty in the X's as well, and incrementally, you know, start from a very simple model and build up one that accounts for uh, these actual violations of assumptions and building up to more complex models incrementally.